a warm welcome to everyone. And I would also like to thank so much the uh, Nordic Council of Ministers, together with, uh, with whom we have worked more than 10 years on the topics that uh, relate to migration in one way or the other. And today, in uh, this session, in this panel, we will focus more on the digital society and digital transition and how this is shaping and reshaping migration flows, uh, both between the countries and within the countries. And also, as related to this as well, the impacts on regional uh, development uh, within the countries. So we have uh, three very distinguished uh, panelists here today. And uh, I will briefly introduce each of you. And uh, I would also like to stress that this is a free discussion. So we don't have people representing certain uh, institutions here, but it is a free discussion on, on this topic. The first panelist is Ave Lauren, who is a top expert uh, and a migration policy analyst uh, in OECD, who has uh, extensively studied uh, different migration-related uh, topics from the highly skilled migration down to the refugees and then many other uh, topics. Then our uh, next uh, panelist is Professor Jussi Jauhjainen from the University of Tartu. And uh, we can make a warm applause to him because he has been just recently nominated as an honorary doctor of the University of Tartu. So <laughs> it's a really big achievement. Uh, the official ceremony will be in the beginning of December. And the UC has been studied a lot different topics again related to migration and regional development uh, in many countries, Estonia, uh, Finland, but also in the African countries. So he has lots of uh, knowledge to share with us. And last but not least, uh, we have also Pirat Hartmann in our panel, who is the Minister of Regional Affairs and Agriculture, also quite recently uh, on this post. And we have been working together with Pirat also for a long time, since she also was dealing with the topics related to integration. So probably we will bring these topics uh, somehow to the table as well, as integration and migration are, of course, always uh, related to each other as well. So off we go. And uh, let's maybe start with a small personal uh, question. Uh, so, so you see, uh, and starting from you, so how has digital transition affected you personally? And are there any bigger changes since the coronavirus and the acceleration of, of the changes or, or how it affects your everyday life? Okay, thank you, Diet. Um, yeah, I we had a small talk before this, uh, this meeting that when this big change started to affect our working lives and, and, and daily lives, and I think it's 10, 15 years ago, when, uh, when mobile phones, internet, uh, emails, uh, virtual meetings became very common. So that was kind of uh, changing our daily practices of employment, daily practices of, of living, of our social networks. And of course, COVID then, then uh, kind of fostered this thing forward. So in, in that sense, it has become an integrated part of, of academic life, I think, all around the world. And the second thing, maybe with this digital uh, transformation or transition or digitalization and migration relates to 10 years ago, uh, especially in 2015, when large num numbers of people came to Europe to seek for asylum. And then it was some, some kind of surprise that most of them used actually digital tools, mobile phones to be connected, connecting towards the, the Europe, connecting backwards. And, and I started to study more, more or less intensively this irregular migration uh, related to uh, digital tools and also the return migration. And also the issues that when people migrate away from their home countries, do they still remain connected to their home countries and how that impacts the integration or adaptation or return migration issues. And, and my, one of my key points from the beginning is that 
actually you cannot anymore distinguish this physical and digital lives because they are so integrated. It, we are physically here, but uh, but digital uh, you know uh, presence is is immersed into lives of people. Ale, so what impacts you feel in your life, personal life? Uh, well, yeah, uh, it's sort of just adding to what just was said. Uh, I think for me, the biggest kind of surprise really with COVID-19 was how little it impacted uh, both my professional life or personal life, mainly for the reasons that this digital transformation had really started beforehand. And I have uh, sort of, I have personally lived in a number of different places and I, c I sort of came to a realization as well that I have sort of benefited from being that generation of migrants who's really, despite migrating, I maintained the ties with each of those places I've been. So rather than leaving a place behind, I feel like thanks to the digital transformation, my personal life has uh, enhanced or uh, expanded with each uh, migratory uh, episode in my life. So I th that's what I would say. Thank you, and Pirat, please. Yes, my s I think the biggest connection with the digitalization I got when I was uh, studying two years ago in uh, Tallinn Technical University. And I was uh, studying the digital changes in the organization. I'm very old timer. I always write the things in the paper. I everything print out because I like it and I'm not too good in the computers. But in this time I was um, responsible of the integration and I understood that in our field we don't have um, enough uh, changes or uh, not enough innovation in the IT. And I understood that if I have to lead this through, I have to first understand it much better. And then I went to went to study that and uh, of course I got some ideas and I hope that now my team is uh, bringing those ideas also in the real life and I'm glad to see my course mate also here with whom we were meeting and this was not good only to understand better the digitalization but also get the connections with the other fields and people of course. Yeah, I was. Uh, I'm we are also Facebook friends and I was really amazed when I uh, read your post that you obtained a master degree, full degree, on top of all the things that you are, you are doing. But maybe a follow-up question from there. So is there something specific you can bring, al bring uh, along from these studies mm -hmm. to your current post as a Minister of uh, Regional Affairs and Agriculture? Mm. I think um, when I was connected with the integration, then I understood that uh, we have to deal with the groups who are very big. And in this year came the also the Ukraines here and we had to deal with, uh, with very many people. But I understood if we want to have the integration, then it always starts from the person. And every person is different. We can have the similar language, similar background, but everybody is very different. And we understood that we have to deal with everybody personally also. And I understood that digitalization can give us some possibilities, some uh, tools, how to do it. For example, if we make the counsel uh, counseling, then how we could do it that it's the personal, not that we are only telling the general services what we have, but how we get better understanding what this person needs are. And when we make this um, uh, language courses, then we understood we have to deal with 60,000 people in one year. And this was enormous number for us because normally we had some 3,000 till 5,000 people. And I understood that I we got some good ideas from this course how to do it. So. And if you brought the, the topic of the tools on the table, then I know that you see you have been actively developing some digital tools uh, in relation to education as well. So do you have some insights here? Okay, this was a question I was not uh, <laughs> being prepared to answer, but um, yeah, like in one sense, I think uh, in these 2020s, we are living in a, a big uh, transformation period. So everyone has heard about, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, generative AI, and so on. But no one has seen it, how tremendous transformation it will have in all aspects of employment, 
in all aspects of education and, and uh, some of these transformations or changes are positive and some are challenging. But I think we are now on the edge of something really big. It's almost of the same size that the arrival of the internet. And it's very difficult to imagine life before the internet. And as I say this, in 10 years time, people say, how could you live and survive without generative artificial intelligence? So, so this, this is part of the digital uh, you know, transformation that first we needed to have this type of tools, then we needed to have the physical infrastructure, and then we need to have this kind of content-related things. So I think that, that, is a, that is a big change. And um, so what I could add also, this is a challenge in a global sense, because it, it is like old times, you know, 20 years ago, not all people had mobile phones, and not all people had access to, you know, mobile networks. Then it took some time for people to have access to the internet. Now, you know, majority of global population can use internet. And the next big cha challenge will be that are we able to use the digital tools in a, you know, equal way? Because otherwise the divide will be stronger and those who are benefiting from these tools will move forward. And I think this is an issue not only, you know, globally, it comes to Estonia as well. So in that sense, if if you drop this bomb for me, I, <laughs> I try to reply on that. Thank you. And you also brought in this digital divide topic. Maybe we will return to this uh, a bit later. But uh, my next question uh, will go to Ome. So you have studied a lot uh, the migration flows, and you are the migration expert now also in the OECD. Uh, so what are your kind of... Um, understandings of how the digital transition has, has changed the contemporary migration flows, both when it comes to highly skilled, but also the other forms of migration, refugees, family migration, maybe. maybe. So could you a bit uh, share some knowledge on this? Yeah, sure. Um, I think broadly speaking, when it comes to the field of migration, as a it's quite hard to break apart what is exactly the digital transformation and what are some other global megatrends because they're so closely intertwined. But if we do try to kind of bring it back to the digital uh, uh, transformation part, I would say uh, three different things. So first of all, kind of building on what you just said, the emergence of different digital tools has really allowed the shift from migration to mobility. And here what I mean by that the cost of migration in the past was very significant. You kind of went from point A to B and you had to invest in integration. In recent years, Google Translate, all these kind of translation tools, people can immerse in their new environments very quickly. So there is this very significant shift to mobility. The other thing which I would highlight obviously kind of goes to the topic of remote work and how this has uh, come into play. And um, I, I come from, uh, I currently work at the OECD, who, which represents the sort of the main receiving migrant countries in the world. So it's the world's most economically developed countries, uh, democracies. But f when it comes to digital transformation, for these countries, the new challenge has been that it's no longer just about immigration, but emigration. Because this uh, remote work has really opened up for a lot of these, the citizens of these countries, the possibility to go somewhere else, work from somewhere else, yet still remain part of these societies. So this is a completely new phenomenon, because in the past, I mean, of course, there was immigration, but uh, the focus was really on immigration. Uh, but uh, this obviously kind of comes with different uh, chal uh, challenges as well. And kind of with this, uh, when we talk about the topic of the panel, the emergence of these new migratory categories, whether it's digital nomads or um, which, in terms of how we understand it, is really a temporary migrant type. So they work remotely cross-border to other uh, employers in other countries, but we're talking about temporary migrants. On top of those, you have remote workers who continue working for longer periods remotely. But now you also see employers taking advantage of these systems that where um, they have their entire units of labor somewhere else. So the digital transformation has kind of really shifted 
uh, how countries approach immigration. So there is not a clear answer how to kind of go forward. Everyone is still uh, experimenting, which on one hand is very exciting, but on the other hand is, you know, it's prone to experimentation doesn't always work either. So it's a, it's a kind of a transition phase. One of the other yeah. Yeah, please. I just got one idea, and I, I think it's very nice thought also that uh, we always remain connected even we go away. It's not only between the countries, but I, and I thought yesterday and today also that there are so many good things, but uh, with the DEEP we were always uh, trying to solve the integration topics in Estonia. With the digitalization, we also have uh, negative challenges when we think about the Ida Viruma or the uh, Russian-speaking people. With the digitalization, they remain in this environment, what we always don't want. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is really big challenges also. It's not always the good things, but there are also the things what we have to solve because uh, what we saw after the Ukraine war started that uh, there were a lot of people that we uh, didn't understood how they still think like that. They live here, they are physically here, but their minds are somewhere else. Yes, I have many follow-up questions, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you see, please. Yes, I, 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 I follow up this, this issue by the social media environments so that, you know, people have started to lose their faith on printed media or books or this type of slow, you know, material. And instead of that, it's getting more and more information that comes from the internet. People many people are not so clear on whether that is truth or is it good or something like that. And I think that is part of these uh, negative challenges I men mentioned about this uh, forthcoming or ongoing transformation, that it's really difficult to uh, uh, ground something that this is really true and this is not true, this is fake. And with this generative AI, it's getting even more difficult because there will be really deep fake things where you can hear your friend's voice and face saying this, or the president, or a, or a politician, or a military leader. And in that sense, it is becoming very unclear what, what is something that we can trust. And I think that is then raising the issue between this digitalization and the diaspora and, and this type of contacts, where you can have selected groups with whom you communicate with, and you get really, you know, biased understandings of what is going on. And I think that is that is a, a issue of migration, uh, integration, adaptation that we are uh, facing now. And of course, that is an issue that we have to deal with. Uh, I had also the same follow-up question, but I will a bit specify, maybe you see, or who else uh, wants to answer. We know that there are bonding ties that kind of tie communities together, and there are bridging ties uh, that, that connect uh, the communities within the countries, across the countries, so on. So wha what is the kind of feeling that, uh, which ties maybe are more influenced by this? Are the community bonding ties or bridging ties or, or any reflections on these? I mean, this is a very tough question. Uh, I would, my first kind of hunch wh when it comes to the bonding and bridging ties, uh, I think here we have to, the communities change as well. So for instance, when we talk about digital nomads, they come from very specific professional sectors. And this has been a phenomenon that has been taking place now over tw 20 years or more, is the sort of professional identification with certain groups. So very strong, this is very strong in startup communities, like they feel very strongly linked to that community. So rather than ethnicity, rather than a regional, so there might be some other communities that emerge and kind of fulfill this bonding part. Because obviously when it comes to, you, uh, in the context of mobility, uh, would you tend to build this bit more the bridging ties and the you know the big kind of challenges um, with integration in the past was like how do you build the uh, bonding ties with local communities, but uh, but I think here I don't have a good answer, uh, but um, what I s uh, what I see when it comes to these specific groups that their bonding ties are fulfilled by the emergence of new types of communities. So that complicates it even further, because then it's like we need to keep in mind that uh, 
you know, what sort of, it's simply not integrating into local nationality, local region, local city, but it, there might be something else fulfilling that. Religious communities, this is something that is uh, not necessarily in a Estonian context, but across uh, the world emerges that people are so closely uh, embedded in those. But there are also um, interest groups, environmentalist communities, so there are, you know, they come in a broad spectrum. So I think it's hard to kind of say in terms of where exactly the digital transformation, what bonds are easier, what uh, kind of ties are easier, and what are being reformed, but it's like I think the transition, why it is so significant as well, I think it goes into absolutely every sphere that we do not know how, uh, how, uh, how what the final product is gonna be. So we need to kind of anticipate all of this. Thank you, Lucy, please. Uh, yes. Uh, like maybe two, three examples of this, uh, this transformation, because uh, when I studied this uh, big migration flow to uh, Europe uh, 10 years ago, people came from Africa, Afghanistan, Central Asia, and so on. There was a certain number of people who were never using mobile phone. They were first time using mobile phone when they came to the, uh, you know, Turkey or border of Europe, and suddenly everyone was able to use it. And then it created certain hubs in Syria, in Jordan, other places where people communicated through this. So then people, you know, you know, part of family might be dispersed. Someone in Sweden, someone in Germany, someone in Italy. So there was certain type of family bond uh, uh, possible through this, these tools. But later, now when we talk, talk about 2020s, the situation has changed in that sense that people are aware of these tools and and especially irregular migrants who come for f economic or political reasons to Europe to try to fight as asylum refugee status or or employment here you know they might show their lives through the mobile device so they go to a very expensive shop put very quickly a, a jacket on take a selfie and send it, uh, look, I made a fortune in Europe. And that creates this kind of, you know, stories through digitalization. And that can then intrigue people in somewhere in West Africa to go to Europe, because it seems to be that my, you know, fellow uh, guy from the same village made it there. So that that is one thing. And the, the other thing in this immersion of this digital, there are also some people who, really left their home country to seek asylum, uh, to, to be a refuge in, in Europe, and they don't want to leave any digital traces because, for example, they, they changed their religion or they were from a particular ethnic or sexual minority, so they and their families, their relatives will be harassed, and it's getting incredibly difficult to be away from this digital spheres. So we have to also think about when we provide this full access and, and possibility to be present in digital realms that we have to allow people to remain out of that because that, is, that can create the dramatic consequences for people. And I interviewed many of them and they said it's really difficult because everything is going on on uh, you know TikTok, uh, Snapchat, uh, Facebook and other tools and if you are not there you are not anymore able to communicate with your uh, you know friends, colleagues and families but it is it is kind of uh, I think that is and I agree with uh, with you that there are different communities emerging professional communities you know, selected hobby-related communities and not always anymore this family bond or ethnic uh, background um, communities. So, so I think it is. And then we, when we talk about generational things, that is also something. Those who are now 15 years old, majority of them are really, really different in, in, in this respect compared to those who are 40 or 50 or older. Yeah, thank you. So it's uh, about diversification, as we understand that there are different groups and different forms of uh, communities are forming. 
there are new opportunities as uh, information is spread, but there are also new vulnerabilities that emerge. So, Pirat, would you like to comment somehow on these issues, also from maybe the policy making perspective and when it comes to migration and integration related uh, topics? There to start. <laughs> Maybe you a little bit specify it there. So we, we discussed about the bonding and, and bridging ties and uh, we, we discussed that this really like diversification is going on because people bond and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, form groups in different ways. Uh, there are new opportunities that maybe amplify also the opportunities to move, uh, but there are also new vulnerabilities that may emerge because people leave uh, digital traces and, uh, and that may also uh, create some, some problems. So is there something that uh, needs like policy uh, focus in or more focus in the policy making? Mm. Now I think if I think about the integration, it was some years ago I was very active there, but of course sometimes I try to also have more overview also nowadays. Um, I think when I think back, then of course in the policy makers have to understand the that the situation is all the time changing and this digitalization is also influencing our policy making. And I think those days we were quite actively thinking also what should we do? And I think the main question was in this time uh, with the digitalization, this communication. Uh, and I very like this uh, talk about those that uh, we have to always think uh, when we talk about the groups, what are their age, where they come and so on with the experience with the Ukrainians, we had always that if we gave to some Ukraine the information, they were so good connected in the uh, social media that everybody actually knew. And we just had to found this, find this uh, somebody, the active member from the community, and they got this connection. So we were also trying these times to think in this field also. And uh, of course, um, I think right now in this digitalization, uh, when we talk about the security also, we have to think more and more about what's going on in social media because many things we don't see anymore in the public or in the, in the, no in the paper media or in the TV or in the street. So we have to very understand what's going on. And about the regional things um, in the policies, um there are my co good colleagues also here, they can also a little bit uh, more tell about, but uh, uh, one project, for example, what we are doing, we see that uh, more and more people are going right now to live in the countryside because they find uh, much better the living conditions there. And we also have to think how to support that. And uh, one uh, activity what we are doing is that we, uh, support to have this kind of uh, environments where you really have the good connection with the internet where you have the other people maybe who are from the interplurs or who are also the other officials that they could work together and have the good connection and maybe not only this comes out that you have the good uh, internet and you sit, in, uh, sit in the nice room but you also have the connection with the other people and with the other field so i think in the our policies we are more and more thinking about that also yeah thank you I mean there were lots of interesting topics that we will certainly take up uh, today uh, like ukraine and regional development but before going there i would uh, I turn to our uh, once again and one of our keywords in the title of our topic is digital nomads so could you maybe elaborate a bit more that f who do we consider when we talk about digital nomads and is it uh, still like a like a more elitist uh, type of migration or do we see any changes especially in light of the digital transition well uh, this is an incredibly difficult one to d define and this is once you start looking at policies ever uh, so many countries by now have tried to define what a digital nomad is there is but there is no kind of shared, shared good definition. So I would rather kind of go, what are some of the key characteristics? That when we talk about digital nomads, we really, we don't talk about remote, uh, remote working as simply as that. So it needs to have an international element to it. So the remote working, the employer needs to be abroad. So this is, because uh, otherwise, once we kind of 
in the, uh, the term has been defined in an international migration context, so it needs to have that international element to it. So the employer and employee need to be located in different jurisdictions as such. But here, the kind of the complicated part comes in, because obviously the word nomad uh, is a direct reference of uh, kind of more continuous mobility. So um, the, th the concept really, the first time started emerging around the same time when digital transformation started. So um, it's been in use since the early 2000s, but really the digital nomads as a phenomena um, kind of came to force in the middle of 2010s. So this is why where you kind of had a new group emerge that were changing their location in every three, uh, generally three months, because this was w the length of the tourist visa. So this kind of prompted them to change the countries. Um, uh, but uh, since then, because uh, a lot of um, governments saw this phenomenon taking increasing place, they wanted to regularize it. So you kind of, uh, since the COVID-19 especially, you have seen an emergence of uh, not necessarily digital nomads anymore, but this kind of a, almost a permanent class of remote workers where the nomad element perhaps uh, is downplayed. So rather than moving every three months, every four months, it's a it's bit longer periods. Um, so, so I think uh, this is kind of the concept per se, but like I would actually kind of go a bit back because you mentioned the regional side. So when we, when we talk about digital nomads, I think it's hugely important to think why this phenomenon emerged. It didn't emerge because you suddenly could do remote work because it started um, kind of uh, get speed in the 2010s. So really the driver was actually uh, sort of economic reasons behind it. The rising cost of living, housing crisis that um, were impacting s uh, most Western countries. And this is what really pushed people to kind of take on this digital nomad lifestyle. When you get a salary from a country like Germany or even Estonia, maybe this will afford you a middle class lifestyle here. But it, if you take that salary to Thailand or you take it to Indonesia, you suddenly live an upper middle class, if not upper class lifestyle. So this kind of the, the ability to leverage the geo arbitrage or essentially kind of the market differences, this, this emerged in the 2010s. Mainly it was the high tech person, but now since the COVID, because so many other sectors went online and there was this kind of, uh, it's still, it still is very specific sectors and speaking of like digital divide and equities, we're talking about, if not elitist that pathway, but this is a kind of a economic uh, mobility model available to very specific workers. But this is what, at the core of it is. It's not, yes, there are lifestyle elements, there are ideological elements, but it's, a, it's an economic migration that's uh, started to leverage the remote working. A quick follow-up. I mean, it opened uh, up uh, these moves between uh, the countries, but uh, other uh, is it still like a big city phenomenon, or do you see also it triggering down to smaller places? Um, so, uh, I think I the migration patterns are very different. Uh, they are no longer, uh, the traditional economic migration generally took place into big economic centers. You would go to London, you would go to New York. So that changed with digital nomadism, mainly because of the desire to get uh, kind of get a, get better bang for the buck. So people went to areas where the cost of living was lower. So, but it's still, they're emerged specific centers. So I would say there are three types of destinations digital nomads choose. So there are still digital nomad hubs. So these are where kind of, yeah, I mentioned Bali or kind of Indonesia, Thailand, these centers that a lot of them for different reasons have conglomerated. It's mainly the infrastructure is there. Another type of digital nomads are those who really go back to their roots. So this is uh, kind of very often a way how countries try to engage with the diaspora. So maybe someone migrated abroad, but now they have sufficient income and they would actually like to come back to their home country, but there isn't an immediate obvious job available to them. So if, it, if they can do it remotely, why not? But there are also these kind of magnets so here, a lot of regional ge rejuvenation policies, they have been linked to how to attract um, digital nomads. I mean, a lot of examples from Italy. 
a kind of the rejuvenation of ghost towns. How do you build the infrastructure, the internet connection, some kind of English language support to attract them? A lot of examples also from US for internal migration, but, but these are then come with very clear policy objectives um, to attract, so kind of magnet destinations. Again, this policy question we can't <laughs> get around from Philip now. So, do you think are there a need or, or ways how to maybe uh, attract these people away from bigger cities as well? Yeah, I got uh, from my specialists the statistic also about Estonia that uh, where are the most people who are not living and working together like uh, who have some distance between, and mostly they are around Tallinn and around Tallinn the people and Tartu. So this is, uh, if we look about uh, Estonia, um, how we support. I think uh, many things also happen so that uh, politicians and ministries don't have to do nothing. And I think one thing was Corona, but uh, give us the push. And now we also see that uh, Actually, the ministries and the public sector is more open that the people are not working in Tallinn or in Tartu or in these places where the ministry places are, but they are in very, very different. That already the idea that we don't have to be so strict with this, that this is your table and you have to be here, that you have this possibility. For example, from my team, half is working away and we can reach it. Of course, we have to also think about this uh, that it's influencing also the team building and so on. There are always the things what are not maybe so positive thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, this, um, I think we have to support, of course, this good internet. We have to support that we have these areas where you can work together. But the other thing is also that when we were uh, the um, uh, Estonian, uh, what is Maoli called, the agriculture, no, not the agriculture, life. Yeah. Life sciences. Life sciences. They made also the research and they asked young people why you would go to live, for example, in the countryside. And they said also, of course, it's good that there is a nice environment, but they need the good services also. And if we want that the people are have this, that they are very mobile and they go everywhere and they don't live in the Tallinn city center, um, you can work in the computer from far but you want to bring your uh, child uh, close to the kindergarten or you want to bring her the children to the school and so on. So these services you need to have everywhere. This you can't, y of course you can drive a little bit to get your food and so on, but there you want to have this uh, very um, good possibilities or good chances to have this lifestyle very good. So I think next to all this internet stuff, we have to think uh, for what is more also important for the people, the library, the culture, and so on. And of course, what people brought out, or the young people, was the transport. I think we will talk about this also, that the public uh, transport, that you reach everywhere easily. And I think this is also influencing when we want that the people would move out from the big cities, that they also reach to their services if it's needed. You see, you're very carefully listening, and, and you have, of, of course, studied these topics a lot as well. So if you summarize three key factors that uh, attract people to the rural areas, could you do that? And then on top of that, how this digital transition has affected this? I, I think the previous speaker already <laughs> mentioned them, but, but like I said, the first thing today, if you want to work, you need to have a excellent digital access. I mean, tools and access. And I think that is also a price issue and, the, and the, you know, the quality of the infrastructure. So I think, uh, you know, nowadays it can be said really, and I say it, the access to the internet is a human right. And unfortunately, you know, three billion people in the world does not, uh, they, they do not have this uh, right fulfilled yet. The access you know, you can do it whatever you want, but it is a really a, a big issue on democracy, on, on learning and, and understanding what is going on. So I think one thing is to, yes, provide the access, provide excellent access, but as the everyday life, you need shops, you need, uh, 
you need uh, need services and so on. So people cannot really live only digital because they have to <laughs> eat and they have children, they have to buy things. So I in, in that sense, the turning to the, the countryside from cities is a issue. Maybe one issue that we do not know yet is because of the you know climate change, because of the understanding of the overconsumption and these kind of issues. So I, I imagine uh, generations coming that start to think about more like local type of life, local production of food and these type of values where they see that they can have zero consumption of carbon and, and all these kind of things. That that might be an issue. I'm not sure whether that be a scale issue, but that is already, you know, turning that people would like to not establish a big house for themselves, but to use the old infrastructure, correct it, put uh, solar panels, and, and think about this kind of sustainable issues. I'm not saying that it will impact 100,000 Estonians, but it will you know, provide uh, both jobs because you need local repairing and so on. So I, I think this type of aspects can be, but it's, I, I, f I still feel it's a next generation issue. Just wanted to add, I had a lunch with the young family who was uh, coming to live in Baide. And in Corona time also, they both work for Tallinn and they came to live here. They were building, uh, they were buying the old building and then they started to renovate it. They understood that the public services are quite good. And then they said, we didn't got um, uh, very good conditions from the bank to renovate the house because they are in Baide, not in Tallinn. Then they didn't got the insurance because they uh, don't have yet the house ready. They have to renovate. So I think, the questions are also sometimes in the details, but this will influence if you have the same possibilities here than in Tallinn. In the otherwise, they are very mobile, they can work here, they can do everything, but if they think, should I stay or should I go, then this little detail starts to play. And I think there we have to, policy makers have to do the things correctly and right. Yes, I uh, one and special aspect is is the return migration from abroad to Estonia, and that concerns only not only you know people in uh, active working age like 40, 50 years old, but also retired people. You know, tens of thousands of Estonians went to Finland in uh, uh, in 90s in early 2000s, and now they are getting to the age of 60, 70, and and they think what to do. And I think that they have quite good, uh, you know, uh, pension and they can, they can live on that. But what Estonia can then offer to them, because they have lived maybe 20 years in Finland or in Sweden, where certain quality of, uh, you know, physical infrastructure exists, the social infrastructure guarantees of, of, of social infrastructure ex exist. So whether they come only for summer holiday for a month or whether they want to really establish their life there. And if these tens of thousands of people come here, of course they use services, but they use also money for services. So in that sense, that, that is a really important issue. And I, I recently uh, finished one study on Estonian return migrants. And it was important for them to have this digital connection throughout their time when they were of way. So they knew what is going on in Estonia. They had their colleagues here, their friends there. But when they came back, it was not super easy to come back and integrate into the life because their mentality was maybe 20 years ago and they saw that, look, 20 years time in Finland, I used to have this and this and this, and now suddenly I don't have this here. And then they said about the mental aspects of neighbors that, well, they didn't seem to be so friendly and than 20 years ago. So I think that is one thing that can be, you know, thought in Estonia that how to, you know, accommodate everyone who comes from Estonia, uh, from abroad to Estonia after 20 years abroad, because they are willing to come, but is the society, is the community welcoming them enough? And I think that is, that is I'm not talking about tens of thousands of people, it can be even 100,000 people. 
Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back to the Estonia and, uh, and also the regional development uh, maybe in a moment. I would, uh, before that, uh, focus more uh, on, on two flows, uh, more specifically as well. Uh, one is the Ukrainian refugees and, uh, and, and uh, how digital transition and, and, and uh, Estonian development maybe is related to this. But also the Global South migration, because uh, I, I would like to capitalize on your knowledge, see that you really have this unique uh, research knowledge also from, from the whole migration route, uh, starting from the local conditions in the origin countries, the route, and, and then uh, also integration issues in the destinations. So, but focusing still on this digital transition uh, uh, element. So how do you feel that the African countries and the, the regions are, are affected by the digital transition? You already mentioned that the that um, there is a more information no, uh, flows uh, through digital tools uh, that might um, uh, attract migration. Is there anything else that could uh, shape the intentions uh, from African countries to, to move? Yeah, I, I think the <laughs> it's one big issue. I think the, the future of the humankind depends on what happens in Africa. So if things go bad in Africa in next 40 to 50 years, I don't see really future for humankind. Because of the, it's not because of Africans, or if it is not because of Westerners or those people who live in Africa, but it's really difficult to even understand the population growth that is taking place in Africa. So. In the end of this century, half of the global population has African background. Not necessarily living anymore in Africa, but maybe somewhere else. So if we do not, you know, if we don't find ways how African countries, 54 countries, develop in a sustainable way, I don't see too much uh, future for uh, humankind, because it's about billions of people who have to find their lives, livelihoods, nice places to live, and so on. If they don't find there, they might leave. And where they can go, it's Europe, Asia, maybe someone crossing the ocean, but it's a big issue. And that is part of the digital transformation and transition. Of course, it is like said here, that if there are employment opportunities, if there is a way to could ma make a good fortune by living in your village or in a town, then you don't have to leave. But if there is not that, then you have to leave. And I think that is a big issue that should be thought here. I heard that in Estonia there are visions for Estonia 2050 or something. I would say that one of the big, big visions in a long-term future is taking account the climate changes and also is that there will be a mass migration because there is no way to live somewhere that is overpopulated where the environment is devastated. So I think in that sense, this, this is a big issue. Estonians could collaborate much more. There's a, young population, the, uh, the average age in Africa is 25 or something like that. So there's a huge amount of people who are able to work. They can work digitally, they can work in many ways. So I think that, that is something that I s I'm sure that after 50 years people say, why we didn't think about that? So I think that, that is what I s say here. So how well Africa digitalizes and how well they are able to, you know, take uh, economic benefits out of that is really a global issue, impacting also Estonia. Yes, yeah, thank you. I will ask a follow-up question on this from Ave in a moment as well, but uh, still uh, from UC first. Um, you are absolutely right that uh, population growth in Africa at the moment is uh, is high, uh, and this poses many challenges, but we see some like brighter developments as well. For example, if we look at the human development report and the educational levels and skills are also rapidly rising in the African countries. So which forms of migration do you, do you see and, and, and uh, what kind of insights you have 
got yourself in, in working in the African countries, and especially in maybe in the more rural areas? Uh, I think the, the, the issue in Africa, it's, it's, it's like, you know, uh, asking from you what is going on in Europe. <laughs> So it, it's you can, you can specify some of the countries yeah, that you know better. So yes, yeah. um, I think the one big issue is that actually there are 54 countries and each of the countries, they are different. So in, in that sense, that's okay, maybe Maghreb countries have a little bit similarities. Some South African, uh, Southern African countries have similarities and so on. But, um, but I don't see yet a major, you know, move forward. There is still a potential but uh, but not uh, not um, not seeing really yet okay there is this kind of things like you know custom free transport of things within africa so there are more look towards uh, what africa could do for itself but uh, i'm not hopeless but i'm seeing that we are really living in a one or two decade that will uh, impact the whole humankind if we if we fail that and i think it's not way in northern europe to think that africa is far away and there is spain and germany and other countries in between because it is a it is of global impact and it's also an opportunity young people want to live a good life they are you know motivated to do things so in that sense maybe these digital con connections maybe these connections are needed, but like I said, I cannot imagine uh, closing Africa, having now two billion people soon, four billion people, so it's impossible. So in that in that sense, this it is a, it is a big issue. And who has then the right to say, you are not allowed to come here? <laughs> you know, there is one house here. After two kilometers, another house, and then two kilometers, another house. So I think that is. A global justice issue, where is livable space available towards the end of this century, and who has the right to uh, live there? Okay, maybe you, you have been also working also with, uh, with migration a lot, and also the policy issues and, and so on. So what kind of reflection do you have on this uh, migration, and especially this African-European migration flows? I mean, when it comes to Africa, um, like Yusi said, it's, uh, the kind of complication there is the circumstances are so different across the board, because obviously, depending on a country, we might deal, well, within the country, we might deal with very strong economic hubs. Let's take the example of Nigeria. You have areas where people cannot live, but at the same time, you know, you majority of OECD countries or uh, G7 countries, they're trying to rush to get into their economic opportunities in those places. So there's an explosion of opportunities there. We're seeing levels of internal migration, well, within the countries, but also in Africa that are enormous. And it's kind of, but, but, I, but I think the challenges there really are that the kind of we're dealing with so many different issues at the same time. Like, uh, you know, when I, in, in the past, I worked primarily with um, economically developed countries, and there, let's be honest, majority of migration policies is about fine tuning. Countries are kind of trying to make their system a bit better. In the case of uh, many African countries, it's really building up systems that have never existed because. European countries have never really had to manage that sort of scale of migration, the difference, uh, you know, people coming from rural communities without literacy. At the same time, you have people with PhD levels that kind of brain drain from Africa. So w some of the topics OECD is working is um, very closely in the context of Africa is healthcare migration, how a lot of doctors and nurses, they're leaving Africa and obviously there, a lot of OECD countries, you know, they're very much welcoming their arrival because there is the populations are aging, so this kind of new uh, cohorts of workers coming in. But what does this mean then to these African countries as well? So, so I think uh, um, I'm definitely not an expert when <laughs> it comes to Africa, but it's kind of the complexities there are that you really need out of box thinking. But it's at the kind of having strong political systems that are willing to kind of, migration is always a tense topic. It doesn't matter whether it's international, inter uh, kind of internal migration to kind of tackle those issues. 
So, so I think the the challenge really with Africa is sort of um, kind of building up their internal capacity to deal with migration as well. Because I think, uh, unfortunately, I, I feel majority of uh, other countries, the way in which they would approach it is very much how they can benefit from it. And, um, and so we need to hear the voice of Africa in here as well. I just wanted to uh, share my experience with Africa. I was uh, in Kenya and uh, in Nairobi, and uh, we were also meeting with different communities, but we were also in one school. It was some six, seven years ago. And I asked also the kids, because they all speak the English there, that who wants to stay here? And there was, uh, in the end, one hand coming up. They all want to go actually away. Some kilometers away, there are this community where all the IT people are together, sitting and making their startups and so on. So you see that there are some possibilities, but I think we were there. We don't know at all what is the environment there. And I had really chance to uh, make this excursion with the person who was living there, went to America to study and came then back. And I think this kind of a people are necessary to there to develop something because they know the background. We don't know. We have our solutions how we have done it here. But we need actually the people who have the knowledge uh, and who have the idea how really the life there is. So but maybe to kind of uh, just uh, build on this point, because I don't think this is simply an African question. This is actually the sort of we were speaking about regional uh, development within Europe as well. What really is needed is a vision of future. And this is how can we use the kind of digital tools as well to provide this vision of future. Because unless you have this, I'm sure you go into a small town somewhere in Italy as well, which is declining, uh, you know, at a... They, if you, you need to provide these b people with a vision, with an alternative. Until then, as you mentioned as well, you know, people who have come to Europe, they send these photos with uh, expensive cars or brand new clothes, wh whether it's real or not. This, this is the vision that dominates. And until we provide an alternative, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard for these children, these young people, to kind of see a future for themselves. I just had one thought more. Uh, you always ask, and how is how the politicians and the officials think? I think uh, in Estonia we are so proud about our digitalization, but if I think about the strategies we have, I think um, they are very good one. They are very clear one, but they think a lot about how the services would be good but they don't think about those visions you are actually telling about. And uh, I think Yussi had so great thoughts about that uh, actually we need to give the people the work, that they would stay there, that they would have enough the income. They don't need to come here. They could work there. We could provide, I don't know, some work there, but we, we don't think about like that, I think, right now, the policy makers. We think too easily about this digitalization. We, we, we use it for our policy making, but I think it's not enough in our visions how we, how we deal with the problems that we will have in the future, with the climate or with some other reasons, with the wars and so on. I think it's very good discussion what was influencing me to also think. Yeah, I fully, fully agree and uh, I, I think Yussi is absolutely correct that uh, Africa probably in the 50-year perspective is uh, certainly the, the main origin country for migrants as all the other regions of the world are also aging rapidly um, and, uh, and uh, there are fewer and fewer countries that can send migrants. Uh, but uh, there is another migration flow that is maybe more challenging at the moment for Estonia and that's certainly related to the Ukrainian uh, refugees. And, and let, us, let us turn now to, to this uh, topic and uh, and you all have uh, studied uh, and worked with Ukrainian uh, topic uh, for a long time from migration and integration perspective, but still framing it with the digital transition uh, framework. So, so what, what kind of reflections do you have in relation to the Ukrainian refugees in Estonia? You see, yeah. Well, I can start because I, I, made, I have made and I'm co continuing making uh, service and interviews with uh, Ukrainians who came to Estonia in 22, 23, 24, and who also have gone back to Ukraine. 
And what was kind of first surprise in, in the spring of 22 was that everyone was digitally connected. Everyone, every single one. And they continued to have this digital connection to Ukraine. So they, they were checking things, what is going on there with their family, with the, the war front and the politics and so on. And they have continued very active communication. So they went maybe physically to visit the place for a few weeks and then get back. So I think that is one thing. Those who returned, actually quite many kept these contacts, depending how well they were accommodated. If they got work, if they had uh, you know, local friends, local Ukrainian friends, and so they continue to have. I think that can be a also a big advantage for Estonia. So if you accommodated here 50,000, 100,000 Ukrainians, in the future, they can be kind of bridge between Ukraine and Estonia, between other European Union countries, because they were there. So the one thing was that they were really digitally connected and they continue to be. So I think that is one thing. And the, their numbers are big, not anymore so big in Estonia, but, but European-wide. We talk about millions of people who have gone and who have get back and maybe have to leave again. So I think these two things are there. And I think that, that kind of uh, very sad uh, necessity should be thought also as an opportunity that how these people who were able to come to Estonia to live here for some time, is it possible to have connections later with them and take care of them and also remember that you were here and I'm sure somehow the of gratitude that you came here so I think that, that would be the, the same thing with the return migrants, that you should remember in positive terms the people who went uh, were here. And all kind, like I said in the beginning, all kind of businesses nowadays digital somehow. So in that sense, when these generative AI, other things are moving forward, I imagine economic opportunities, social opportunities uh, between Estonia and Ukraine in, in 2030s, a lot using the opportunity of those people who now know already uh, Estonia and who might even rem uh, remain here. Um, yeah, so um, over the past uh, two years, this is very much has been <laughs> what is the focus of my day to day to day work. So uh, as was uh, mentioned before that the kind of uh, the really the first uh, the Ukrainian displacement crisis has been sometimes uh, described as the first really digital refugee crisis because because of the degree of these connections, the way in which that, that where are they located in host countries was driven by pre-existing conditions, how the information, where to go, how to go, this really was transferred at a speed that has never been there. But what we are thinking about now much more and more is how to leverage the digital transformation in the context of reconstruction of Ukraine and how to kind of use that then to tap into these refugee communities abroad. So uh, one of the kind of uh, uh, OECD has been put forward a concept of dual intent integration. So the idea behind it is to support socioeconomic integration while removing also barriers to return, to really kind of design um, integration with that in mind. And one of the key elements of this is really to support Ukrainians in maintaining digital ties. So whether it is, in because uh, Ukraine has amazing digital infrastructure, thanks to Estonia to a large degree, we have been an inspiration, the idea, all of this, how to leverage the governance system they have to maintain these ties with um, uh, the communities abroad that they still feel invested. But the other thing is, um, you know, every obviously everyone is hoping that uh, the war comes to an end, there is a peace, but the reconstruction process, um, even the most optimistic prognosis, we're talking about decades. So the returns of these individuals will take a time. They will not go back over time. Nobody's returning unless they know they have a house, they have a job, they have a place for their children. But they want to contribute. And this is where the remote working can really come in. And the Ukrainian government has been investing in a lot of digital skills of uh, especially uh, female refugees abroad to really kind of use that. That even if you're not physically in the country, 
that you can start contributing towards that. So I think there's a huge potential. Pilat, do you have any reflections? You have also dealt a lot uh, in the beginning of the war with the integration issues as well. Yes. My experience is, uh, I think, first experience was that uh, this challenge was uh, pushing us to make much faster the innovation in the integration in dealing with the so many Ukrainians very fast. We had so fast the uh, courses, the integration courses in the online and uh, studies and so on. And uh, we really uh, were having uh, good ideas out of the box uh, how to have the also integration without uh, coming physically together. So I think this was very much push pushing our policy makers. The second thing was that we understood that in many things uh, we had a very uh, good uh, development already. Uh, our colleagues uh, from Ukraine came here to study the digitalization in the culture because I was working in the culture and uh, I think this was also one thing what we understood that we have to keep the culture and the cultural heritage and digitalization is helping us very much. And Ukrainians in this time, I think we're not thinking about and they really s fast started to think and I think we also, we maybe had it too slow and now we are much faster with that. I think the digitalization really kept the people ha to have also the connection with the Ukraine because the pupils who came and started to study in the schools in Estonia, many stayed in the Ukraine schools. They would have just cut it this through if we wouldn't have this uh, internet possibilities. But um, I think nowadays, uh, and maybe this is not very popular, but I say out, my colleague in the uh, Ministry of the Culture said also that, Pirat, you know, you do it so good right now and uh, people see how good life you have in Estonia. And I think uh, with this digitalization, many people who came here see how bad the situation in Ukraine still is and they want to stay here. Not that we are against, but the people in the Ukraine and the mostly the people who live in the ministry, they are very worried that they go don't get their people back because the people see what is the situation here and what is the situation there. And they are have more security to have the kids here in the schools than there. So it's again, negative and positive uh, things that are influencing this. Mm -hmm. I will open uh, a floor uh, to questions uh, in, in about the five minutes, but before that I will open the, the last topic and, and in relation to Ukrainian refugees, we, we also know that uh, as the flow was quite big, uh, uh, we tried to also redistribute, dis redistribute uh, Ukrainians more evenly across the country, so also outside the, the major cities. And, and maybe from here we, we come also to the regional development issues more, more specifically, we have discussed all these migration flows. And maybe again, uh, starting question to you, you see that, I mean, you, you summarize some of the key factors of regional development. But if you summarize three factors, how we can build the digital society in a way that there are no left behind regions. So what would you say? Yeah, if I would say that, <laughs> I think I would be, you know, invited to everywhere. <laughs> so, but I think, I think the key point is also innovation. It's the ability to, you know, leave something past and to transform. And I think that, that is something that I do not underestimate to reconstruct things. And I think that, that is something. If you, if you think that you have found, uh, you know, the stone of wisdom, I think then you are already too late. Then, then something is going in a wrong direction. So I, in, in that sense, you need to be adaptive, you need to innovate all the time. And I think another thing is, good thing is to listen to people. I mean, <laughs> what they want. <laughs> because, you know, people make their decision. Whether I go to live there, what I want, do I'm happy there. So in that sense, you know, it is not something that you have to hire an international consultant to tell that. You just go to people and ask, what do you want? And then make a sense that whether that is feasible and how you construct the services and so on. Uh, and Estonia, in the end, if you look, look globally, it is very small. So I think the, if we talk about regional development in most countries, they would say, that, well, this is a half of region, the whole country. So in that sense, it's, it's really fine-tuning issues. 
like you know whether you have a bus service or whether you have these type of things. And I think the the one thing where I finish is this that uh, I think the sustainability issue is probably something that is taken much more seriously in a future, in a near future, in ten years time people start to say that, look, I want this, or I don't take this. And I think that is where you can build up t type of carbon-free things, ca type of uh, locally embedded uh, value chains, and so on. And since uh, Estonia is quite sparsely populated, you can, you can create this kind of value chains. And I think in that sense, there are possibilities. But I think there is needed state's help municipalities help because it cannot be only, you know, people cannot construct uh, roads or, uh, you know, this infrastructure. So in that sense, that is there. But I imagine the next big change will be the sustainability demands. And I think that that caused the electricity use, the isolations, all kind of things. And there, that is something that can provide jobs, maybe with African colleagues or whatever. Uh, a quick and tough question also Pilat, to, to you. So in Estonia we are discussing about uh, four regional development scenarios at the moment. But, uh, the first is that uh, everything goes as it goes uh, till today. That uh, Tallinn, the capital city region, is still the main magnet uh, of growth and people and talent and so on. The second is that uh, this trend is even amplified by international migration. We, we, we learned from UIC also that we should be prepared for that. And the two last ones are more policy related that to try to somehow target the growth either to the regional towns, that's the third uh, scenario, or even further to smaller places, that's the fourth scenario. So if now to contrast these four scenarios with this digital transition and digital society, so what would be your reflections and, uh, and how could digital transition kind of shape these scenarios? and, and and can it somehow make it happen that the third and fourth scenario, regional development or small town and small places growth, is somehow enhanced by digital transition? I think it's a very good question. <sighs> it's uh, it's how we look at it. Uh, I think the um, digitalization is one hand a tool with what you can do whatever you want. In the other hand, it's also the thing what will anyway uh, influence us, whatever we want or not want. I think with the regional policies, we first have to think what we want, and then we should think how we use this digitalization as a tool to get these aims and to get these visions what we have. If you ask me, I'm, uh, I think that the first uh, this way is not the way we should go, because uh, I think um, we should have more uh, regional equality in Estonia. We should have uh, better uh, living possibilities everywhere in Estonia, and not only those big cities, because I think it's the question of the security in many ways. Not only this, that we have covered the Estonia everywhere with the people, but it's also a question about the food, because the people who get the food and who produce the food are living in the countryside, and if there is nobody living, then it's also so many other kind of uh, questions. So I think the first is we have to think what we actually want, and then we have to think the digitalization as a tool to get those things and also think that how the digitalization will influence as an environment because I'm also very agreeing with you see that the RE will influence us very much. It will take some workplaces, it will give the new workplaces, it will influence very much. We even don't know yet how much it will influence and I think right now we have the talks how many it should, how much it should influence but I think it's not anymore the question. The, the, this, this is already gone, this discussion. I think it will influence because there are huge developments already and we can't stop them anymore. So I think the first is what we want and to answer together with the Estonia to this question. Thank you so much. And uh, now I would uh, like to open the floor also for questions from the audience or comments, whatever. Any thoughts? 
uh, I have, uh, because now we are uh, all thinking uh, very locally that uh, we're talking about nation states and uh, uh, with a small group of people who are getting into conflict because of those groups are very small. So for example, different uh, countries or religions. But maybe uh, there is a time to think uh, broader and we have the tools that digitalization language also a lot of people speak English uh, maybe a like a cross border uh, nation <laughs> haven't you thought about that that uh, it will be a layer on top of the local states because now nation states are having conflict with the corporations anyway that about taxing and uh, the money uh, also they're competing about uh, the workforce but a lot of those big problems can be solved maybe l taking a bigger picture not that you are identifying yourself with uh, a small group with but a bigger group and we understand that because European Union and big countries people are levitating towards them because they see that bigger things work better. Yeah, thank you, please. I, I think it's a very great question. And uh, I have thought about, because uh, I have to say that my kids have uh, two citizenship. They are the Estonians and they are Germans and they are er European. They don't think that th I am one or the other one. They think much wider. And I think it's a good question. But first I would say that sometimes we think too big. If we talk about the integration in Estonia, and my good friend is coming from Narva, there are the people not thinking if I am Russian or uh, Belarusian or Ukraine or Estonian. I'm a person who comes from Narva. And sometimes to give the person uh, the good feeling and the environment, you have to connect first with the area he is living. Yeah, this is your yeah. And, 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 and I think... Yeah. But I, but I just want to say that sometimes people think locally. They, they don't search the roots from somewhere. They want to find the roots here. And uh, in the same research I was talking about earlier times, when we asked young people like uh, if they want to move to their countryside, they said one reason also to have the good community with whom you have the connection. I think it always depends your on, uh, your the answer to your question about the people. I think if we talk about Estonian, because I can talk about I'm the Estonian, we always want to find the roots from the Estonia because this gives us some power, what the maybe the bigger identity is not giving us. But I think if we go further and this development goes as it goes, my kids already have this European identity. We can't stop it. But I think we also can't uh, uh, motivate this. It comes from ourselves, I think. But for me, right now, I feel is very important this very, very local community and uh, the relationships there. Can I uh, just kind of come in? But I think this is kind of links to the fact that you have all these new types of groupings emerging. Because I agree, I think there are, there are some people who are very strongly local, some very strongly feel global. So I think the kind of challenge is how to make sense of these new associations that people have. And there is no good solution. I mean, we were kind of talking about mobility and migration. Now you have also a big policy issues. You have increasingly communities where you have long-standing residents. You have people who come through who might spend there less than a year. Uh, but wh whose voices are represented? Who are politicians representing? Are you representing the sort of community as a whole? Do you represent your c uh, citizens, denizens? These are very tricky issues, especially in big global cities like uh, London or New York, where maj majority of your denizens are there temporarily. So, so I think there is no good answer. It's definitely a debate that <laughs> needs to happen, but, um, but yeah. And as we well know, the digital transition has uh, shrinked the world and, and made it smaller and, and more closely connected. 
but the Cavendish academician uh, Laurie Melkso has very nicely summarized this kind of background of your question that two very fundamental kind of values in, in, in democracies and uh, Western countries. One is the value related to universal human rights and the other is uh, the value of democracy and the right to decide uh, on what's going on in your, your country or, or community or region. And these kind of two rights uh, get into, into the clash and then certainly it's not the easy and as we also know, migration brings opportunities to the countries but also between countries, conflicts are brought to the countries with migration as well. Um, so it's, it's never an easy, <laughs> easy, easy, easy question. So Yussi, would you like to add something on this? Well, uh, yes. I, one, one thing is, of course, this po <laughs> political system like this exists about 400 years or so. So it has been quite established that we have states and, and they tend to be nation states. Now if you look at the Olympic Games and the teams of Italy, France and so on, so you understand that the nation states have becoming multinational. And, uh, but still state is the kind of political organization, how the earth is divided in, in territories and there are you know, laws and regulations that this is the game now. Of course there are big international global corporations that run over the states and so on. Again, like I said, I don't know what will be in the future, probably in the case of existence of the global you know, community, humankind, then you know there might be a need to really re-establish the whole system. But to get rid of states and states kind of competing interests, it's, it is uh, quite difficult. But we are the state. So I mean, if people would start to say, I want this and I want the state to behave like that, Technically, I think it is possible as long as we are in democracy. And maybe digital tools are so that, that a community will emerge and rise and start to question, is the exploitation of nature too much? Is this you know, inequality too much? Is this wasting of these resources too much? And if they start to demand, then the states need to obey to the people. But you know, whether this revolution will come in my lifetime, I don't know. But sooner or later, I know that the whole system will be in a, a big trouble because of the really over-exploitation of whatever resources we have. And I have met, like I said, I have met a lot of asylum seekers from here and there and from 50 countries plus. What people want? They want to have peaceful life, they want to have family, they want to have something they can contribute to. They want to work. So I think this is something really a human thing. And then the states can help them to provide that. It can be, you know, uh, delegated to local authorities or regions or something else. But this is what basically people want to. They want to have nice, peaceful life with friends, family, and, and work to put their effort into that. And I think that's that's not super difficult in the end. Yeah, thank you very much for the, this intervention. We have time for one more uh, question, comment, reflection. Yes, please. I really appreciate the wide number of topics you discussed today. And I, I could only think of a few things that really didn't get brought up and that was a discussion of different types of immigrants. Like I come from an immigrant country, we've been stealing the best and brightest for 100 plus years, and it really is a form of theft at one point from someone else's point of view. And another topic that didn't get really discussed is how technically do we share the resources? We talked about the negative aspects of you know, not being equitable, but this supra sort of state global way of sharing doesn't exist and well international law is pretty much broken so what 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 do we suggest what is the way forward you see would you like to <laughs> i think i think you uh made the agenda for the next by the arvamus festival <laughs>
how we, you know, fix things. And I think I agree. There are many kinds of migrants, voluntary force, blood, and, and, and you know, second generation and so on. So I think in, in that sense, I, I think the, but I agree that there is a need, I mean, United Nations can do the, cannot do that because it has seemed that the, it was based on nation states and they have certain rules and uh, security council and so on. So it, it is not the format. It was a format that was made based on really strong nation states. So it can be something else. But I still think that it can come from bottom up, from people to start to demanding better you know, lives, better schools, better environment, better jobs, more equal this and that. And I think that, that is the way. If we, if we turn up greedy, then there is no hope. But I think in the end, people are not greedy. They, they want to have this kind of peaceful life with uh, you know, things around. Maybe one thing when it comes to uh, there is a l I mean there is a lot of discussion in terms of brain drain and what is how does this impact and this kind of goes into these resources but but I think what it kind of comes down to is like when we get into these technocratic conversations it really depicts human beings as a resource so it's very easy to go into uh, you know let's take the example of uh, Ukrainian refugees it's like where do they need to be what is more equitable at the end of the day these are going to be individual decisions and i mean the the challenging bit is some individuals have more capacity or resources to make those decisions so what we really should pursue is to provide individuals with equitable chances to make those options for themselves because we um, i mean in democratic systems we trust that people know the best what they're what they want so this is that their voice are heard so in some ways migration should have that element as well that you know that it's law abiding that you migrate according to migration laws but it's, it's really up to the individual, and this kind of then goes down to whether it's different regions and countries providing a vision for themselves, so, and then empowering individuals to make that decision for them. So uh, I'm just, I'm always very sensitive when it comes to depicting migrants very much as a kind of resource to move around. Yes, in some ways they are, but it should be a kind of individual's decision. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a, a topic for a new a new uh, Arvalos festival, but it's also a topic with what we can very nicely close our panel. I think the way we want to build a digital society should focus on equity, equity issues, opportunities for, for all groups, for all countries, for all regions. And uh, I think that's one of the big uh, challenges. I would like to thank you so much. Uh, the three, three panelists today were Ava Lauren from OECD, top uh, migration policy expert, Professor Yusi Auhainen, a professor of geography from the Turku University, and Pirat Harman, Hartman, the Minister of Regional Affairs and Agriculture. And I would also like to thank very much the Nordic Council of Ministers uh, Estonia office for organizing this panel. And all you for taking part of this interesting discussion. Thank you. <laughs>